Welcome, everybody, to another Late Talk Live. I apologize for the long headphone cord, but to have fly tying and Brian and I on, there's some microphone issues and echoing, so hopefully this has cured it. Um, but welcome again. Welcome to everybody on my Phil Rowley Fly Fishing Facebook page, my YouTube channel, and for my private member Stillwater Academy group. Uh, it's great to see you here. It's great to be back. Um, it's been a busy summer uh, for both Brian and I. Myself, I've been, uh, you know, Brian and I, were, it's good. We're back doing schools again. So we spent a week doing our school at Corbett Lake Lodge. I also did a school at Skitcheen Lodge and another one at Stony Lake Lodge. I spent some time in um, uh, Colorado as well in July with a uh, good friend Landon Mayer uh, chasing fish around there. I've always wanted to fish still waters down there. Uh, but it's great to have Brian on again tonight. And tonight we're going to talk about one of our favorite uh, fall food sources uh, that get on the menu, really drive fish crazy, and that's water boatmen and back swimmers. Arguably two of the most confused food sources out there often get mixed up with each other. It's good to know the difference uh, because one of them can give you a bite if you're not careful. So the goal of tonight is we're going to talk about their life cycles, uh, both boatmen and back swimmers, uh, our leaders we like to use, basic leader setups, fly lines, retrieves, to discuss our fly patterns a little bit, and then if time permits, which I think it will, or if you guys want to stick around, I'm going to tie uh, one of my patterns and one of Brian's pattern. Uh, I'm going to do one of Brian's boatman, his yellow boatman, and I'm going to do my uh, greater water floatman. These are both flies available on our uh, Stillwater Fly Fishing store as well if you don't tie. And don't worry if you got to disappear off, you can't sit through the whole thing. This is being recorded and it will be available uh, on both my Facebook page, Phil Rowley Fly Fishing, uh, on my Stillwater Academy group as well, and on my YouTube channel so you can catch it. So let's bring Brian in and get going. How you doing, Brian? Hey, Phil. Another beautiful, unfortunately, really warm early fall day. <laughs> Not so much here in Alberta. We've got a bit of a cool stretch. In fact, as I was setting up, it was actually raining, which is much welcome. So I know we're getting together next week at Corbett Lake Lodge. And... Uh, um, looking forward to seeing you again and spending some time on the water. And uh, hopefully it looks like things are going to cool down a little bit while we're there. And, yeah, uh, yeah should be good so fun. I, I don't know. It's, it's archery uh, season oh, right no. now, first 10 days of September. So I'm doing these early morning archery hunts, and then I'm going fishing for four hours in the afternoon. And I did see a couple boatmen hit the water today. And uh, that was refreshing. Yeah, it's, um, I know here in Alberta, when I moved here, that was the one food source in the fall that is really prevalent here, um, both on lakes and believe it or not, rivers. One of the strongest boatman falls I've ever seen was on the Bow River. And I remember stepping on a rock that I thought was black. And when I put my foot down, it was covered you couldn't see anything on the rock because of all the boatmen that were on there. So yeah. I did really good wet fly swinging a water boatman on that day. Um, so it's not just a river, uh, sorry, a lake and uh, a still water food source. It's, uh, it's very important. And here in Alberta, they get going any day now. They could be even going now with our lakes being so warm like yours. I haven't really had a chance to fish locally since uh, early mid July and uh, our water temperatures just went through the roof and our lakes are so shallow that it's just not prudent to be out on the water when that oxygen is so low from all that heat. But I'm looking forward to uh, getting out there and chasing boatmen and back swimmers. So, so Brian, we're going to review um, their life cycle. So why don't we get started with that and you can walk everybody through um, the water boatman section. We've got a little presentation for you, a little bit of video. If you guys have questions and girls have questions, uh, please pop them into the comment section and we can drag them in and we'll do our best to speak to every one of them if we can. If not, I'll answer them uh, after the show is ended to make sure everybody gets an answer to their questions. So I'm just going to add this presentation into the stream and uh, back it up because Brian and I were checking things out. So here we go. So Brian, take it away. Let's talk about Boatman first. Okay, so just a quick introduction to uh uh, Bowman and Max swimmers, they're, they're members of the order Hemiptera, which are water bugs. And uh, there's about 300 species of, of the insect uh, order Hemiptera living in fresh waters in North America. 
and certainly water boatmen and back swimmers are uh, make up uh, a large number of the species. In fact, there's uh, almost a hundred species of water boatmen found in North American uh, waters, and about thirty species of uh, back swimmers. So, you know, in reality, there could be several species of uh, both 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 boatmen and back swimmers in the, in the lakes that we like to and rivers that uh, that we like to fish. So these guys have uh, have a uh, incomplete life cycles. So they go from an egg to a nymph to the adult stage, and uh, the nymphal stage. For both boatmen and back swimmers, they go through multiple, what we call molts or instars. And uh, it, it uh, so in a period of, uh, in a typical one year life cycle, uh, the boatmen and back swimmers will molt four to six times before they finally uh, reach the uh, adult stage. And so you can see, you actually see immature boatmen and back swimmers in throat pumps um, usually uh, early to midsummer and the uh, takeaway when you see these things is that they both have very large eyes they're pale in coloration and uh, they don't have a their their shell their wing back their uh, shell back that covers their wings isn't fully developed yet so they don't look quite like they the uh, like the image that you're posting right now of a of a that's a fully matured uh, uh, water bowman and uh, that's a beautiful picture, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Back from my aquarium days, yeah. the one that actually stood still. Yeah, this is a mature one because you can tell by his darkened wing pads. Yeah, so so we're looking at so now we're looking at a water a water bowman, and if you look closely at the at the uh, tip of the abdomen, the back end of, of this bug, you can see the the, the hairs that uh, that are uh, protruding out of the lower side of their abdomen, and those are the hairs that that the bubble of air uh, envelops, which is called a plastron. And so, water bubble and back swimmers all water bugs are air breathers so they they have to come up to the surface to breathe or they trap a bubble of air uh, which boatmen and back swimmers do and those little hairs that you see are the integral part of uh, the formation of that basically that bubble of air that these guys can live on as they dive down and uh, feed as well as uh, uh, go on uh, egg deposition uh, forays. So important feature to note. Uh, so typically for the life cycle of these guys, um, well, first of all, the shape, they're oval, they're streamlined uh, uh, shape. Um, the bowmen like have small heads and oval shaped uh, body. Um, and then they both boatmen and back swimmers have uh, wings underneath their uh, their shell backs, and the big difference to to identify the difference between a boatman and back swimmer is that when at rest, the the boatmen hold their legs, their hind legs, straight out at a ninety degree angle, just like that guy there. So that's his hind pair of legs that are feathered and elongated or like. And that's what propels them through the water. And if we looked at a, an adult back swimmer, those hind legs would be on an angle. There you go. See how they're offset? They're not 90 degrees. Uh, they're less than that. And so that's, the, that, that, that's, that's a physical uh, difference between the two. But also, there's, there's a difference in size, whereas uh, water boatmen rarely reach uh, uh, half an inch in length. Uh, back swimmers can reach almost three quarters of an inch in length. So there's a size difference as well as there's uh, differences in uh, body coloration as well. So because both of these guys are air breathers, they trap that plastron bubble of air to allow them uh, to 
dive down into in down deep into the water column. And both of these insects live through the winter under the ice. And they do this because when lakes freeze over, uh, there's not a, uh, it's not like a nice smooth sheet of glass. There's air pockets and uh, they, the, these insects find the air pockets and uh, they can make it through the winter. So if you're an avid uh, ice fisherman, chances are you've augered a hole, uh, hit, a, hit a pocket of air, and when you pulled your auger out, you're, you're going to get a couple hundred unhappy boatmen or back swimmers that uh, are going to come out of the water uh, with your auger. So uh, that's how they survive through the winter. And that's a key uh, piece of information that explains why boatmen and back swimmers are an effective pattern right at ice off because they're a food source that, that's ready available um, basically from the day the ice comes off right until the day the uh, ice uh, comes back on again. So they're, uh, so just to summarize on their life cycle, uh, both uh, well, water boatmen typically uh, go on mating uh, swims or flights in the spring months or uh, in the fall, in the early fall. And uh, they'll often leave one lake and fly to another lake to not only feed, but also uh, to complete mating as well as egg deposition. So that's why you can be uh, on a lake and, and a nice sunny late, late September day and it's glass calm out and one o'clock in the afternoon, it starts raining. And it's either boatmen or back swimmers that are diving into the water um, and then diving down to feed or more likely to deposit eggs. And uh, trout can sense these guys hitting the water. They know it's the right time of year for them. So they're on the lookout for them. And that's why you can have some phenomenal fishing in those um, summer days. And uh, they're most active during daylight hours. I've, I've not been on a lake and seen boatmen falling in the evening hours. Have you, Phil? No, it's generally in our neck of the woods. It's, um, you know, in early September, sort of the early fall season. I think we talked about that in a previous uh, Lake Talk Live we did event on understanding the fall. So if you check out my YouTube channel, it's there. Um, but generally those days like you're going through right now, Brian, are warm. So our hatches or falls more appropriately are um, typically like noon, one o'clock when the heat of the day is there and go right through until the afternoon. And of course, as the day is cooler, those um, it fall of those uh, egg laying events and, and falls um, typically start to occur later and later in the day because they always are to me are always been closely related to the warmest part of the day. So yeah, like you, I've never usually in the fall months by I don't know five o'clock it's dark, so we gotta go home. So um, yeah. yeah, we never get to exactly. never get to see them. But for me, it's generally been a warm warmest part of the day if they're gonna go um, in the fall months. And again, as you touched about in the early spring when it gets warm, because a lot of the species in both these uh, insects also reach maturity in the spring as well. So you will have. Uh, mating and migration flights in the spring as well, which most people I don't think are aware of sometimes, but I know you and I have been out together and, and seen that happen. So it's, it's fun that you can take advantage of them spring and fall. So that, so we can, we can see Bowman activity uh, in five feet of water in uh, 55 feet of water. And that's, and that can be in the spring or the fall. So that's why we, um, we have to be prepared to fish patterns on a variety of fly lines from floating lines, which we can fish floating patterns because fish do, when these guys, when the bowmen and back swimmers hit the surface, they're momentarily stunned and they'll often do a few spinoramas trying to get orientated. And that's when the fish will come up and eat them off the surface. So a floating bowman pattern, a foam 
because I know you like to tie foam, foam yep. uh, bodied ones uh, uh, can be extremely effective uh, w when they're taking them on the surface. And obviously, you will know the trout are taking them on the surface because it's a pretty vicious swirl. Yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's all of a sudden, I remember I was guiding a, a couple and we had to bump and grind through the morning until the cloud sort of broke. It was kind of high overcast. They broke, the sun came out and all of a sudden the lake looked like it was raining. Like there was rain, there was little rings everywhere. There wasn't a cloud in the sky and the fish were just going crazy. It was just one incredible afternoon. And so, you know, we, we it's, it's a fortunate day when you can get them on floating patterns, but more often than not, you're going to be fishing subsurface patterns. Uh, and uh, the, um, so we can, we can fish subsurface patterns uh, with floating lines uh, and uh, speed headed patterns, boatman patterns, but more often than not, we're fishing uh, uh, intermediate sinking lines, clear camo lines, type three, type five, even type seven. Yeah. Sinkers and sweep lines. Uh, because the, what typically happens, say uh, the fisher, uh, the, the, the bowmen are falling in 35 feet of water. Uh, so they're diving down and then eventually coming back up to the surface. So we want to imitate that swim down as well as that swim back up to the surface. And that's why we are using pole sinking lines in, type, in that depth of water, type five, type six, type seven, uh, traditional sinking lines, not, not density compensated ones. So we get a nice belly in the line with the tip section sinking slower than the, the mid uh, head section. And so you get that U shape. Uh, so you cast it out as far as you can, you're gonna, uh, let that fly line sink and then you can start your retrieve and then during the retrieve the initial part of the retrieve you'll still be pulling the fly down and then you'll you'll get to the bottom of the apex of, of, of the u-shaped turn and then the fly is going to be coming back up and so you we can imitate that uh downward swim and then the uh return uh swim back up to the surface of the lake uh, yeah. And, uh, That's why I like those foam based patterns, Brian, because I use the the sweep lines or those sinking lines to drag that fly down, similar to how we drag boobies and other buoyant flies down, because that air bubble makes those bugs buoyant. So if they don't scoot and move, as soon as they stop, they're going to start to bob back up. So when you strip, strip, pause and pause it, you get that sort of natural rise out of the pattern that simulates a boatman or a back swimmer that's taking a quick rest. Yeah, no, and uh, so, but but you could also be having you could also be having boatmen and back swimmers falling in ten feet of water. Mm -hmm. So that means we're going to be using uh, we obviously a much slower sinking line, like uh, an intermediate sinking a uh, Aqualux or a clear camo uh, slow sinker, or even a a type three casting out, letting the fly drop close. To, uh, close to the bottom, but not right to the bottom, and then beginning that jerky, uh, fast trip retrieve. I mean, these, these guys are swimming quickly through the water, and and uh, that's why with our patterns, we're uh, you know we've got legs on them to to, to give the uh, imitation of them swimming through the water, and you can see, <laughs> see these guys are supercharged, uh, yeah. and uh, they're there's that's how fast they swim and. Uh, uh, they're, they're pretty efficient swimmers. So it's not a, it's not a slow hand twist retrieve. Uh, it's, um, it's a quick, uh, you know, th three to four, five inch poles, uh, you know, right quick. So we're just stripping fast and, yeah. uh, just, uh, you never know when you're going to get the bite, but it'll be a good pole because they are chasing a fleeing food source. And there's also some conjecture, Brian, that they fish, and I guess particularly with back swimmers, because they're a, a predator, and we'll talk about those in a second, 
um, they crush them to kill them. So a lot of times the, the take you get is quite out of proportion to the size of the insect. You'd expect that take with a much larger food source, but it's a take you and I and others to get to take advantage of this uh, know and love. So so this is a question that Derek had asked, uh, yeah. whether we're an integer fly or run a team of flies. So you can use two flies in Alberta. I'll let you answer that one. Sure. Uh, we can use two flies almost everywhere else other than where you are, Brian. So we do it all the time. And Ryan makes a good point here. A good buddy of mine, Ryan. Good to see you. We're here from you. Uh, we fish a technique called the washing line. So we will fish multiple flies on there. And the washing line is kind of a dry dropper in reverse in that you'll have the buoyant fly. I use it, And you'll see when I tie my fly tonight, it's foam based on the back. That will hold the fly up. And then you hang another traditional or even a beadhead pattern off an independent dropper. And that allows you, you know, the combination of your fly line and that buoyant fly allows you to hold a fly at a set level um, and target those fish. Because I found on our local lakes, we can have days where they're eating both boatmen and back swimmers. And, you know, they'll go for an hour and this isn't exact, but they'll go for like a period of time where they'll eat the boatman and then they'll flip over and all of a sudden show a preference for back swimmers. So with a dropper situation like that, or just uh, two flies, uh, maybe, you know, sometimes we use flies with bead heads and a floating line because they'll plunge down to imitate a diving uh, boatman. The other benefit of those patterns with a floating line is if fish are rolling, I, and I'm using, I can cast, pick up and cover them. Uh, because a lot of times you plop your fly, that plop of the fly landing on the water is very reminiscent of what the naturals are doing, and they'll turn and come back and look for it. Much like you, you use on rivers and streams, you'll drop hopper patterns or any fly that makes a splash because they're also using their lateral lines. And if it sounds like food, they're going to turn around because, as, as you mentioned, Brian, they get in a real frenzy. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, let's just ask whether it's a quick turkey retrieve, uh, very similar to a, a fast strip shrimp. Yeah, you, you want it moving, and uh, as as Phil was just mentioning, uh, you know when those when those guys are hitting the surface of the water, you can you can almost pat, pattern a, a moving fish that's taking them and cast ahead of the last boil you see whether it's with a floating pattern or with a sinking pattern. And uh, that, that, those fish hear the vibrations from the fly hitting the water and they'll, they'll turn around and, and, and investigate what just hit the water. So uh, it's a fast, quick trip retrieve. You want to yeah. keep moving. Yeah, I'm using that or a really brisk, erratic hand twist. Right. Sometimes you got to give yourself a break because your hands get tired, but that take is uh, makes up for the pain and suffering you've got to go through. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe uh, just a few comments on the color of Bowman. Uh, they typically, uh, in a mature water Bowman, they typically have a dark brown to black backs and then lighter underbellies. Uh, and and uh, you have some modeling uh, to the back. Uh, uh, coloration, but often, uh, you know, the underside is pretty a standard color. Many, many years ago, we used to use masking tape yeah. uh, bodies because that, that was a, seemed a very good color, representative color. And now, and then, so don't forget, you know, these guys have got that plastron, that sheet of uh, mural of, of glass uh, air bubble that's down there. And so uh, lots of times trying to imitate that shiny, uh, uh, the illusion of uh, that trapped uh, bubble of air uh, down below. So you can see the material that Phil's got on that fly is uh, translucent. Uh, it's, uh, it's, the, I mean, it's kind of picked out yeah. uh, synthetic material. So it's going to give the illusion of that uh, that uh, trapped bubble of air as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's an actual yarn that comes on a spool. God, I can't remember. This is a pattern on my YouTube channel called the Tin Man, and it's just got thin skin on the back, a silver bead at the front that helps suggest the, the splash, a little uh, barred rubber legs, round rubber legs, and a little bit of red on there just to suggest, you know, the eyes. I don't think you have to get, you know, anatomically correct. And it's also a little bit of a mylar um, butt on it too to attract a bit of flash. So. 
Yeah. So, uh, hold on. Let me get the right thing going here. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's talk about back swimmers a bit, um, and we'll get to the leaders. So, back swimmers, as Brian mentioned, are larger. They're nastier. These are a predator. Uh, boatmen are pretty well omnivores. Um, they eat uh, vegetation. Uh, these guys are meat eaters. And when I studied these in aquariums, one of their favorite foods was their boatman cousins. So, so much for family loyalty. Um, they actually um, are uh, the same oval shaped body. Um, they've got those, uh, they're kind of like a, a praying mantis, those raptoral legs, I think they're referred to, uh, where they actually grab and hold their prey. And as we mentioned, that 45 degree angle on the legs. And I, I remember seeing a question, does the leg position um, uh, make much sense? I'll just see if I can find that. Uh, it might have scrolled through. There you go, Brian. Uh, does it really matter, the angle of the legs? Uh, probably not, um, because when you're stripping them, you know, we're using rubber leg material, super floss, uh, round rubber hackle, goose biots, anything that when we pull the fly, it's going to make those legs kick and look like a sculling boatman or back swimmer. So probably not, but we all like to tie our flies with a little bit of pizzazz one way or the other just to make them look a little better. So there's a back swimmer there. Um, you can see again, it's, it's. I think these legs are like this because as their name implies, they sit um, when they're, you know, they're air breathers. And Brian mentioned on the other one, there's little hairs that you can see on the tip of their abdomen. I think I got another picture uh, here that shows that better. But they'll actually use those to poke through uh, the surface tensions. And so they can actually sort of snorkel their way, if you will, and take in the air until uh, a predator, uh, some form of lunch comes by. And these guys are capable predators. They can eat anything from a small fish on down. Um, so I think sometimes those legs are sort of in that position. So when they see something, they go scooting off, they grab it with those four legs, they're their proboscis, their nose is long, and they inject their prey with an enzyme that liquefies their body tissue, and they kind of drink them like a Slurpee. So this is why you've got to be a little bit careful when you handle these. These are one of the few stillwater bugs that if you are a little aggressive with them, a crush one and, and all that, they can give you a nasty bite. I've never been bitten. I've also never put my hand on a hot stove, but I know it's hot. Um, but I've talked to some that have and say it's painful, like a wasp sting. So um, yeah, you want to handle them with care, not handle them at all. But as Brian and I both experienced, when these guys are falling, they'll end up in your boat, right? They'll end up in your pool, right, Brian? I always remember giving you a call and you were bemoaning having to clean all the back swimmers, boatmen, and the larger uh, predaceous diving beetles as well <laughs> that cascade into your pool. First world problems, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, but and then you can see there. Again, they both got these prominent eyes. Their head is kind of uh, a light olive coloration, sometimes green. There's different species. You'll see this hourglass, wine glass shaped markings on their back. Um, and they have the lighter backs and darker bellies because, again, they hang upside down. So that lighter back, when you look up, it gets lost in the surface reflection. And yet, when you look down on one, if the water is a little bit dark and stained, uh, they blend in very, very well with that olive to, um, dark olive body. So um, that's what, what they look like. So they're large. You know, Brian mentioned the smaller flies, like uh, 12s and 14s are sort of standard boatman patterns. We're tying these on 8s and 10s because they can get big up to 5 eighths of an inch. Um, you know, like boatmen, they, they lack gills. They, they use a plastron. Um, they have both these insects have little pores along the body that they uh, absorb that air uh, in their little breathing bubble um, that uh, is attached to them on their underwater treks. And then every once in a while, of course, they got to go back up. So that constant uh, coming up to the surface and going back down or those falls where they crash in, uh, fish get tuned in to that activity and, uh, um, you know, uh, start to take these flies. And it's uh, they're pretty aggressive. I, I was always led to believe that fish didn't eat uh, back swimmers, that they didn't taste very good or whatever. And, but I'll tell you, since uh, where I am, uh, the fish eat them a lot. Um, and sometimes in preference to uh, the more widespread boatmen, maybe they're bigger. I don't know. Maybe they taste better. I, I, you know, who knows? But they definitely eat them. So don't think um, that they don't eat them because they definitely, they definitely do. Yeah. So, yeah, Timber, you... <coughs> Excuse me, it's just a cough. Um, 
Um, yes, it's not so much of a sting, but it's a bite, and it feels like a sting. So, uh, yeah, handle them with care. This is what they sit like when they are at the surface. So you can see the tip of their abdomen in this uh, image, and you can see that reflective shine. So that white back, that white back, that model back is going to blend in. And there's just, that guy's just sitting there waiting for something to go by, having a quick breath. You know, he's breathing, he's resting, he's comfortable. And when lunch or dinner or breakfast goes by, it's on it. You can see those front legs. Uh, grab their prey. They use their middle legs like boatmen to hold on to things, and their back legs, their feathered back legs, are used for propulsion. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've talked about uh, their coloration again light backs, dark bellies, their size, their coloration. They're kind of opposite to boatmen. So, they're bigger, lighter backs, dark bellies, um, and, and less widespread. Whereas boatmen, again, darker backs, lighter bellies, and uh, smaller. And, and don't bite. So, that's always good too. So there's a, a throat sample just to prove that they do uh, they do definitely uh, end up in the diet of trout. Of course, there's our favorite bug right there, Brian, in the top <laughs> left. Got to like those when they get in there too. But you can see one, two, three of those in there, and most of those were alive. So um, I let them go, I think. I think a couple of them are still swimming around. So with our throat pumps, we're saving insects' lives. So, uh, yeah, and it looks like uh, Derek – learned the hard way um that uh they do they do bite so uh not a pleasant experience and i'll believe you uh i've seen the way they feed in my aquariums and i did not want to uh experience it myself so so that's the sort of the we'll just go to a um a little bit wider here with us both brian and we talked about the um the uh uh lines we like to use uh, my leader setups are pretty simple um, you know, when I'm fishing floating lines, I'm, you know, I'm typically using like a seven and a half foot tapered leader with the base of most of my floating lines down to maybe a type three. I get a little bit of backbone in there. Um, sort of that thicker loop, um, with a tapered leader doesn't bite into the fly line. And then I add tippet just to make whatever length I want. So typically my leaders are nine to maybe 12 feet. If it's really clear, I might go to 14. But when you're trying to cover rises, I find the longer your leader, the less accurate your cast tends to be because the flies can move left or right of your target and uh, you, you miss them. So, uh, you know, I try to get away with as short as I can, particularly when you're targeting rises and those splashes. You want to put your, it, you can't help yourself. You want to drop your fly and minx amongst all that chaos and get a grab. So, um, you know, pretty simple leader setup. So, are you doing anything different, Brian? No, that's about, you know, I don't. I think the big mistake some anglers make is that their leaders are too long. And uh, like you said, especially if you're hunting fish on that are feeding on the surface, you, you, if the leader's too long, you're, you're, you're going to not be in the zone. That fly's not going to, you don't know where it's going to land. It, it just makes it that much harder. Yeah. Uh, and then with sinking lines, you don't, you can get away with, you know, a nine foot leader and then a bit more for tippet is usually adequate yeah yeah it's uh you know maybe on a sinking line with a single fly i might go a little shorter just to keep that fly in relative proximity to the the tip section of the line because we're trying to control our sink rate and, and do countdown techniques to because sometimes they'll take boatmen just on the surface sometimes they want them near the bottom sometimes they want them go traveling to and from the bottom um, so you've got to keep your options open with those different fly line choices and pattern styles, whether they float a little bit, they have no weight at all, or they have some sort of weight. And a lot of times we're putting the weight. Years ago, we used to use lead wraps because beads didn't exist. Yes, we're that old. And uh, um, that would help the flies plunge down and get down quickly. So that's a favorite technique for me to use when I'm using floating lines or midge tips is to have a weighted pattern to go down if the fish are taking them subsurface in the shallow. So. So, Brian, I thought we could go through. I can put the other camera on. We talked about this uh, Tin Man ear. I'll, uh, <coughs> I will uh, uh, see if I can get a better layout here. Here we go. Nope, I don't want that one. I want that one. Uh, okay, we'll go solo. So that's the Tin Man. We talked about that. We'll put one of your um, patterns up. This is your Peacock Boatman that's available on our store. And really simple flies. Uh, you know, we see some complex flies out there. You know, one of my favorites is the... The ultimate boatman but it's a complex tie this is your your uh peacock uh water boatman brian we sell in the store real simple right yeah it's an easy 
easy fly to tie, and it's you know those uh, those stretch floss legs, and, you know, help it a uh, little bit more action through the water, and then and, and the uh, plastic chenille body. It just gives the illusion of uh, of the of the of the air bubble that's uh, that's being uh, trapped on on the underside. Yeah, and you can see when you uh, get my dubbing needle here. These legs are pretty supple, so they're going to scoot. You know, when you strip this back and forth, they're going to scoot uh, on this too. Uh, and then this will be the pattern I'll tie in a few minutes. Again, what I love about your flies, Brian, is they're, they're not complicated. And I think as we get more experienced, smarter, wiser, these less complex flies are great. And this is your yellow water boatman. Yeah, another, you know, it just, uh, it's a good color combination. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the goose biots just uh, they do, um, you know, obviously flex a little bit in the water, um, but uh, it, it, it's just <coughs> been a proven pattern for many years. Yeah, yeah, we'll tie that. That's just a simple. You're using uni floss uh, for the body, uh, rainy stretch flex in dark red brown, excellent color for a lot of different flies, including coronamids. And then those brown goose biots, real simple to tie. This is on a size 14. Um, so this is a, a good fly that way. And then we've got a pattern of mine I use a lot. Um, and again, I'm, I use a lot of foam in my flies because I like to have the ability to fish the fly on the surface or with a fly line change, drag it down. Like use some sort of sinking line setup and drag it down. And this is just a, uh, a booby foam. You could use two millimeter foam. I just like the rounded back. It's black. This is, uh, you could tie us with dubbing. You could tie it with mylar body. Um, I think I originally, in my first book, I tied it with crystal chenille. Now I use uh, brill or straggle or micro polar chenille out there for the body. Again, just, this is all about imitating that shiny reflective look. And this is a fly that uh, will work well on a uh, washing line setup if you're allowed to use multiple flies or um, you can drag it down, or it, when they're taking them on the surface, it's a, an effective little dry fly as well. And then my back swimmer, uh, I'm going to tie tonight. Uh, and uh, yes, I tie it upside down on purpose because this is a fly I will use at the surface a lot of times, but I will drag it under and strip it down, and it's called my greater water floatman. It was kind of my response to a uh, Jennings Ultimate Boatman, which is a fantastic fly, but it's... Uh, I used to cut a lot of foam bodies in half and cut my fingers and all kinds of things. Um, and that's a great little pattern, but this is uh, similar. We'll tie this uh, in a few minutes and show you how it's done. But real simple, a foam back, uh, the legs on the front uh, tied out of, um, uh, you know, barred stretch floss or these are grizzly, uh, grizzly legs, I think they're called. Um, you can use round rubber hackle. It doesn't know whatever your favorite leg material is. And then like a brill or a... Uh, uh, straggle or uh, micro polish in your body or you could dub it um, you could certainly do that too i like using these materials because they're reflective and frankly they're just easy to time in and wind them up so uh it works really really well so let's get brian back on board so brian anything else yeah. before we jump into the tying oh i, I think we're you know i think he's couple of things you need to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, it's opportunistic uh, to, to come onto a hatch uh, or, a, or a bowman fall or a mating flight. Uh, it, we typically see the most uh, intense falls uh, and flights after we get a, a, a frost yeah. and uh, for the fall. And uh, so that's usually, well, depending on elevation, but uh, it's uh, mid to late September into early October, depending again on elevation. And so uh, that 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 first frost or whatever elevation you're fishing seems to trigger these uh, insects to go on these uh, mating and swarming flights. Um, and so something to consider. So, but really, after any time now, from now to the, you know, to late late fall, it's, uh, you want to make sure you're, you've got your uh, boatman and back swimmer patterns with you. Yeah, yeah, that's the same. It's funny though. We ours will go before the frost really get going, um, and I guess each area is different, and insects adapt to the climates and the environments they're in. Um, we um, 
thankfully haven't had any frost yet. I think you get the benefit. Maybe frost stirs you because you get to fish into November and even December sometimes. Um, we don't. We're drill, we're drilling holes <laughs> if we want to go fishing then. So, in, you know, in the prairies, anytime after uh, Halloween, we're on ballroom time as far as uh, being able to find uh, open water. So, okay, so why don't I start? Um, there's no other questions so far. Um, keep them coming if you want. Um, and I will um, start uh, tying by tying Brian's first. So I'm going to forge ahead. If I'm doing something wrong with your fly, you're going to let me know, right, Brian? Because <laughs> I, may, I may go off uh, off recipe a little bit. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I think I, think I, I got it. I trust you, Phil. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see how we do here. So I'm going to take uh, me out of here a bit. Uh, hopefully, nope, I'm still in it. Um, I just want to make this big. So I'm going to go here. Uh, can you still hear me, Brian? Yep. Okay, so you can talk and comment. So we'll make this big so everyone can see it. So this, the hook I chose to use, uh, Brian and I both love the Daiichi hooks. We're using a 1530. Um, you could use a 1550. You could use a dry fly hook as well. Um, these are a little... Uh, these are a heavy wire hook. They're pretty stout uh, because, as we mentioned, they can be aggressive. Uh, I'll see if I can bring the camera in a bit without losing too much. Oh, that's too far. Um, too much focus. So I'm just going to put my hand here. And it's just it's just that uh, that was a little scary when it went black. It's the last thing you want to see when you're doing a presentation is your camera go black. All right. So I'm just <laughs> forgive me for playing around with this. I knew I should have left it where it was. All right. So I'm just going to get, what I have to do is get my big body out of the way because the camera seems to like it better. Uh, okay, so we're pretty reasonably sharp there. Okay. That looks good. All right, and I'll push the manual focus and that will keep it from hunting. So I'll just push that button again. There we go. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to start with first for the body, I kind of use... Um, this, this is the body material, <coughs> uni stretch in yellow. As we mentioned, it's different colors. You could use tan, you could use a light olive, um, but this is Brian's yellow water boatman. And I just put it on a floss bobbin. So I'm just going to get this started just behind the hook eye and basically use it like tying thread, thick tying thread. So I'm just going to get this down, get my scissors prepared, come in, trim away the excess. Take that down right above. Be careful of the hook point because it will fray this stuff. Come up to about two thirds of the way. And then for the back, I'm going to use some of the rainy stretch flex. Uh, this dark reddish brown is an excellent color. So I'm just going to take a small section I removed from the package. I'm going to lay this on top like so. Come around with a, a loose wrap and envelop it. Trap it down and then pull on it. A little bit to reduce bulk and wind that right down to the base. I want to make sure that when I pull this forwards, I'll use my other finger here so I'm not blocking the camera as much, that A, you see this bit of yellow there, I need to go back a little further. So I'll do that and make sure that when I pull it over, it's not pinched or anything. It's going to come over the back nice and even like so. So we'll flip that back and now we're going to just go back and forth a few times and build up some bulk. And, yep. and the nice thing about this uh, uni stretch as well is you can give it a counterclockwise spin when you're looking down, and that will flatten out your wraps for you, just like you use some of the UTC products, and you'll get those nice, flat, wide wraps. And you're just going to build up a little tapered cigar shape uh, body, go back and forth each time, maybe not as far back, just to build up the midsection more than you're building up. So. Should I make one more pass, Brian, or? No, no, it's getting to be good shape there. Okay, we'll try some wide wraps. I don't want to push my luck. And then I'm going to come in. I'm going to go to about the midpoint, and then I'm going to get some brown tying thread here. Uh, and just going to start that right at the hook eye. This fly gets a little busy at the front, so I'm just going to get that tied on. Try not to have a mass tangle here on camera. And then I'm just going to come up. Just sort of work this around, bring this up, tie off two to three times just to firmly tie off the uh, 
the yellow. And I like to cut it off on the top, so if I do have any frayed ends sticking out, um, they'll be covered up when I build the head and pull the shell back over. So that's tied off there. And then for the legs, brown goose biots, right, Brian? Yep. Okay. Looks like I'm on track. So I'm going to take two of these off. Try not to drop them on the floor. And I'll just set one of them aside. And I like to tie them on independently. I'm not that coordinated anymore to do it. So I'm going to lay one on each side. And you'll notice, if you look, hopefully it shows up on camera, there's a curvature to these. I want to tie these in so the curvature, the cur natural curve of the feather is pointing out. So I'm going to come in just a couple of wraps. Make sure they're positioned right. You know, I've just got a couple of wraps on the one side. That's in place. I'm going to take the other one. Sometimes moistening your fingers helps pick them up. I'm going to do my best to lay it along the far side so it's sticking down the shank. More or less the same length as the other one. So again, two wraps around. Just lay those out a little. See how they're they're going there. Looks good, Brian. Yeah, that's good. Uh, right. Oh God, I'm gonna. I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to. Uh, okay, I touched. I trust. Tested my luck there. So I gave it a little pull. I thought the far side was long. And what I've learned with these things is sometimes you bang your bob, and I've only got about four wraps on there. So a good idea, and this is something I do with stretching materials too, if I'm going to, is just put a half hitch or a one or two turn hand twist, and that's lock those wraps off. So if I bang the bobbin or whatever, it's they're not going to come undone. I'm going to have to tie on new ones. So now I'm just going to come in with a pair of fine point scissors and do my best to trim these as flush as I can. And pardon my hands blocking here, but I'm trying to see. So I've got those tied on. And then uh, just tighten up my bobbin here. So you can see we've got those signature legs sticking out, that nice yellow body. And then all we're going to do is pull this over. You don't have to pull it over super hard. You know, just get it across the top. I'll put a, uh, not that loose. Um, if you don't like it, undo it. So I'm just going to pull this across again. Again, making sure at the back, I just sort of smooth it out to make sure it uh, goes around. You know, there's no sort of pinch. Boy, I'm doing well here today. I was tying these and practicing, Brian, if you can believe it. So this wouldn't happen. So um, there we go. We got them. So a couple of wraps. Give it a tug. That'll settle it down. And then a couple of wraps. That locks it off. And then all we're going to do now is carefully trim this. I'm going to spin this bobbin. This UTC thread I'm using counterclockwise again to flatten the wraps. And then I'm going to also at this time put a little brushable super glue on the thread. So when I'm securing this down, it's going to start binding those materials in so there's no wing cases sliding out or anything, a shell back sliding out like so. You don't need that many wraps. We're good to go. And two or three turn whip finish. Maybe the head's a little bigger than I like, but... Uh, I don't think the fish will mind. Um, and that's basic yellow boat. boat now, Brian, I have been coating these with a UV resin on the top. Do you do that yeah, now? You know, that's a good idea to put, if you've got it handy there, Phil. Yeah. Just uh, it gives you another 10 more fish you're going to catch on that fly. <laughs> yeah, and I think it also just makes that uh, makes that uh, back shine a little more. So I just put. I was using uh, Solares uh, Bone Dry. And I'll just cure that quickly. Light's probably starting to die on me. These, and you can also use sometimes the resin to set the legs out a little bit, yeah. um, so it'll hold them. But there you go. That's dead simple. Doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, that's Brian's yellow water boatman. Easy to tie. And if you don't tie it, this is a fly we have for sale on our online Stillwater Fly Fishing store as well. So, um, is there any questions we're seeing there? Uh, Brian? Oh, make sure you put that in your Corbett box. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, they'll, they'll, there'll be a few there. Uh, let me get this out of here for a second. So let's see if there's any questions. Um, there's Chuck. I saw him. He's a friend of mine in Alberta. No frost yet, but hopefully they'll be active soon. Heading out for a few days tomorrow. Well, let me know how you're doing, Chuck. Um, uh, because 
I'm going to be busy this fall, so I'm not going to get much time on my local lakes. Uh, and Brent's got a great question here, Brian. What uh, What's your thoughts on that? On uh, Loop Knot. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I like I like to put a loop knot on any sinking Boltman axumer pattern yeah. surface and then uh, you know I'll fish it with a clinch knot on uh, on a floating pattern. Yeah, I, I tend to use loop knots for about the only fly I'll use a clinch knot tight to the hook eye is when I'm using um, jig hooks, you know, uh, balance flies tied with slotted beads or the new uh, those tungsten head turner beads we like uh, because when you cinch them tight and actually cinch that knot a little bit sort of back towards the point, um, those flies will hang horizontally um, for you. So, um, yeah, I'm a loop knot uh, fan as well. I just use it, that total confidence in that knot from a variety of flies. Um, and I saw another question here on the tying. How long do you light the UV on the fly? I'm, I'm assuming you're asking about how long I uh, pop this. I'll just get us sort of both out. I'll get me out of the screen here and Brian and uh, well, so, but I'm just flashing this, you know, 10, 15 seconds, maybe um, to, to cure it. Um, and that's usually uh, works good. Um, it doesn't take too long to cure it. You could also use super glue, uh, brushable nail, uh, Sally Hansen's hard as nails um, if you want or anything like that. So uh, if there's no other questions, uh, we got about 10 minutes or so left to go. I'll tie my uh, um, greater um, water floatman. Um, and it's called this because I had originally, in my first book, I had the water floatman, which I showed you er earlier. And I believe in England, they refer to back swimmers as greater boatmen. Um, they often refer to boatmen as Corixia um, there, which is sort of a takeoff of their scientific name. Uh, but uh, for this, I'll just enlarge the screen and go get me, get the um, this back. We lost your sound, Phil. Is that better? There you go. You're back. Okay. There's no echo? Okay. All right. So I've got the 1530 here. You could use a 1550, which is a lighter wire uh, as well. So I'm just going to put this in and debark the hook. And I'm actually going to tie this with the hook upside down to imitate that sort of upside down posture of the natural backswing. And I'm using, uh, this is a watery olive or a light olive, a chartreuse. And of course, my, my thread has to come out of the bobbin after sitting in here for days. So, dang tough, people. It's my apologies. It only hap happens when you're doing a demo. So off camera, I'm uh, sucking this back through. So I'm just going to get the thread started and wind this down. Just covering the shank, snap off the tag and be mindful of that hook point. But I'm just taking that tying thread oval and just going back again about halfway between the point and the bar. And the first thing I do is set the leg at about the two thirds point. So these are the legs. You could use round rubber, hackle. These are grizzly flutter legs. They look kind of cool. You could use silicone legs, stretch floss legs, all those kind of things. That doesn't look terribly level to me. There we go. It's a little non-level. All right. So I'm just gonna take a single strand of this and I'm just going to tie this in place. You can see how I got that one sort of on that front angle. I do try to mimic that. So I'll do a couple of wraps from front to back. And then I'll come up past the thread, sort of weave it between the two. And now go from back to front over, the, over to the far side. And uh, that sets the uh, near side legs. And I'll trim these off so they're not getting in the way but you can see I've sort of got them positioned uh, I'll just figure eight those in place a little bit 
You probably use if you wanted to. If you're really crazy about it, you could put a drop of UV resin in there, and that would set them in place. But again, as we talked about, leg position probably isn't important to the fish. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry for coughing. So for the back on these, you could use um, two millimeter foam. But what I like to use, this is about a five or seven millimeter booby eye foam. And I take a um, straight edge and I cut, I cut one of these by sliding the straight edge right down the middle like so and pushing it. And I've already done it because I was deathly afraid I would maim myself on camera. But I've got two um, halves, so I've got enough for two flies here. So I'm just going to take one of them. And make sure I got enough to make the trip. So a minimum of slightly longer than the shank. So I'm just going to take one end. And uh, I tied it to a bit of a point just to ease tie in. So just back of, of the uh, legs, I'm going to grab it by the tip. And I'm just using wide. I'm not using terribly tight wraps. I want to compress in stages. And I want to make sure I have enough. And I don't. So, do that. So, you get to watch me cut this on camera. This could be interesting. So, what I'm going to do is just put this straight edge and just kind of saw it up there like so. If you can see that. And then without too much bloodshed. And again, I'm just trying to cut this down the middle. Just waiting for this thing to slip and you'll have arterial bleeding all over the camera. Like melting mono eyes, Brian. So again, I'm just being careful. What you can do too is just pull on it too and kind of pull it through if I can get a grip on it. All right. I'm going to do the rest off camera here just to have more control. That should be good. All right, so I've got a long enough length, and I've got that sort of trimmed to a point, so I'll just bind that in. And just, again, these open wraps, just to get this onto the shank, being mindful of that hook, hook point, and making sure that this is going to pull over straight over the back. So I've got that in, in where I want it. And now I'm going to come in and spin that bobbin counterclockwise, flatten the wraps, and just add extra. I'm compressing this in stages. I'm, I'm actually using 70 denier. You could probably use 140 as stronger, wider wraps. Um, but as long as you're not super aggressive, that's tied in. That's not coming in. If you want, I don't always do this, but you could take a, at this point, this is a dark olive green Prismacolor marker, and you could get the wide side of it. And just come in and color the underside. So, again, you're trying not to get it on the top. But, uh, again, when you're using markers, sometimes you can just get in and just let the, the ink off the mark bleed into position. You don't have to touch everything. Just hold the marker in a spot. Basically gets a little dark. I got a little on the edges there, a little aggressive. I'm not terribly happy with that, but. That's what we're going to use. So we got the legs in, and now we're going to form the the body. So you could use straggle, strailing, brill. It depends what naturals you got. Sometimes they're dark olive. Some kinds of more of a medium olive. So I'll just grab this brill here. Get this from uh, good friends Kent at Canadian Llama. So we'll just uh, unravel. Give yourself, you know, I've got, you know, eight inches of this stuff. Uh, because I actually tie it in up at the eye and go back and forth up the shank to build up a little bit of bulk. So I'm just going to come in and just sort of navigate the thread through these legs like so. Got those tied in. Now I'm just going to take this material, the brill, the body material, and just the first two or three wraps. So you got to fidget through and oh, pull it out. All right, we'll get her in. Now we're in. Try to get away with minimal wraps. Okay, we're back on. And this fly is also on my uh, 
YouTube channel. I guess I'll have to add to your, your yellow rope with them, Brian, next. So we're just going to wind that through. I'm just trying to get up to the legs. I'm trying not to, to knock them out of the position. So I'll come up, and I can actually figurate this through a little bit. I'm just trying to make sure these are swept forward, like so. Go back, close touching turns, right back to the base of where the shellback's tied in, the foam shellback. Come back through, right up, underneath, weave it through, come on up, and tie it off. Don't crowd the eye, because you'll have a great water floatman, but you'll crowd the eye and you'll have a hard time tying it on. So we just got that, like so. You could, if you wanted to, come in carefully and trim on right here just to trim a path. And now I'm just going to pull the foam over the top and pass that bobbin over evenly, like so. And just, again, the one risk of using lighter thread is you could break it. And because it's fine, it can cut the foam. So probably 140 is better to use or a, a heavier denier thread. And then we're just going to put a couple of wraps in front. Again, you can see how that eye is exposed. And I'm actually going to come through and do my whip finish behind the foam. So we just disengage like so. And find my scissors. The tying portion is done. So now I've got to create the head. So I'm going to come in with my scissors and trim it straight, almost even with the, with the eye. I want to make sure this is reasonably square and just come in like so. And then I'm going to round that ed, head a little bit by trimming these on an angle. Like so. And get those legs into position. Around with them. I'll trim those later. And now we get to do some artwork. So the first thing I do is color the head. And this is a chartreuse sharpie. Uh, because when it hits the foam, it kind of goes light olive. So again, I'm just touching the tip, letting it bleed into the foam. So I don't, you know, I'm trying to get this where only where I want it to go. I'm not, I really don't want it on the back. And then I'll go underneath. And just make sure I got it covered there. So anything in this sort of foam head is the chartreuse color. And then I'll put this signature um, sort of that wine markings. And I missed a spot. You didn't say anything, Brian. Okay. That's done. And then I'm going to take a fine point black sh Sharpie, and I'm just going to very carefully, basically from the middle of the back down right to the base, draw a single skinny line. Not too thick. This is just a little thicker than I'd like, but good enough. And then I come in. And I form the wine glass. I'll show you. I'll, I've got to look at it while I'm doing it. But I've drawn one mark like the, this. And then I'll draw a, another mark on the same angle. Like so. And then I'll just fill it in. And if you want to imitate some of the model mark, Markings, I put little stripes on it. They're probably not anatomically correct, but the fish don't seem to mind. So I've got that like, like that. And then the last part is to give them red eyeballs, which is a red shark. And I just come in on that flat spot that I cut to, to suggest the head. is just dab that on there and do the same on this side. I'm just letting that bleed off the marker. And then I might come up slightly on the head. Don't overdo it or you'll end up with an all red head. And there you go. I've, all that's left to do is trim the legs. So I just want to make sure they're the same. 
So I'll push them forward and just come in, trim them, about shank long. And that's the greater water flow. So I'll fish this as fly a lot um, on the surface when they're rolling around because this fly is actually going to fish this way where the fish are going to come up like this and they see that back. Um, and you can also use sinking lines and drag it down and scoot it around um, and, and let the fly line drag this down and scoot it around with those retrieves we talked about earlier. Nothing too bad. We're back. We're back. So, yeah, no blood. <laughs> I was worried when I pulled out that straight edge, things were going to go sideways. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, um, good question here. Um, do you find the markings work better than just the plain back? Uh, arguably, probably not. Um, sometimes we put things on flies for our own sake. And it gives, for me, it gives me a little bit of confidence. The fly looks a little better in the box. It's more likely I'm going to pull it off the bench and put it in the game, and I'm going to fish it a little better. So uh, arguably, no, after a good chewing, uh, a lot of times the markings start to fade on this. You can put um, a coating on there like a Dave's Flex Cement or something like that. Unfortunately, you can't use the resins because they don't adhere into the foam, and I they'll pop off. And um, so... Um, if any of you've got a good material that, um, I'll just pop this back in here for a second, that uh, coats this and protects it, I'm all ears. I've played with it for a lot of years, and I want it to dry smooth. You know, I guess you, you could put Aquaseal on it, but that, you got to wait for that to dry. And I don't know about you, Brian, my Aquaseal tends to harden up after one use, and that's the end of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what other questions do we have here? Let's just get rid of that one. Uh, I haven't yet. Um, the last couple of times I've been at Henry's, um, there wasn't any Boatman or Backstormer activity. I would love to hit it there with some of those big hybrids. Uh, we were just using uh, leech patterns, minnow patterns, and scud patterns and did well there. But uh, if they're present... And those fish get clued into them. Um, it could be some pretty exciting fishing uh, down on any of these lakes. So, uh, super glue. Um, you could on the back, Derek. But what I found with super glue is it makes the uh, marker bleed, and uh, you know it just looks ugh, uh, at the end of it. So unfortunately, no, um, because it activates with the, it's a, I guess it's a bit like a thinner with the lacquer based marker and, and uh, just makes it bleed. So I, I did try that maybe if you're careful with it, but uh, what you got to watch is when you're smear it, putting it on with the brush, you don't kind of smear it around because it does react um, while the, the, the glue is still in a liquid state before it has a chance to harden. So, all right. So I think we've talked about all our questions, Brian, is there anything else you wanted to add? We've just gone over an hour, one hour and eight minutes. We we covered it pretty well in your the, the little video you video clips and images, the photos you've got really added to it tonight. So I think anybody listening tonight that has not fished Bowman and Back Swimmers will have a pretty solid understanding now on uh, what to expect and how to present patterns uh, effectively. Yeah, they're pretty. Um, hopefully, we've taken the mystery out of it. Uh, they're. A, a fun, when they're on a man, it's it's it makes me look forward to the fall because to me the fall is the best of times and the worst of times because you have some great fall fishing, less crowds, larger fish start to show up, fish are aggressive, but that only means winter's coming, yeah. <laughs> and then not so much good fishing. Um, so if you want to learn more about stillwater fly fishing, um, Brian and I both have a couple of books. Brian, you've got your Morris and Chan on lakes. We sell that on our store as well. Um, I think I need you to send me some copies still, if you still got some. And uh, I've got my Orvis Guide to Stillwater Fly Fishing as well, which uh, Brian helped out on as well. He was gracious enough to keep me on track in the How Lakes Work session. Um, and uh, we both done schools with or online courses with Anchored Outdoors as well, right, Brian? So you've got your Chronomage course. And mine, I've been working on a course with April from May. That sounds a little... Or months, sorry, from uh, middle of the middle of the spring 
and it's finally just been released this week. 17 chapters. Um, if you're a premium member on April's uh, Anchored Outdoors, uh, it's waiting there for you to watch. If you want to purchase it, you can purchase it for 147 bucks, and you get it for perpetuity. You can watch it for the rest of your life. And April is, I think she's throwing in your course as well, Brian. Is a, we're a pack, we're a package deal now. So I'll put the link to that in the um, both when I finish up here on my Facebook page, the link where you can go have a look at that. Um, if you're looking on April's social sites, I think Brian and I have been sharing as well with some video clips to give you a bit of a, uh, a sense of what those courses are all about. Pretty comprehensive. And uh, I'll also put it in the description of uh, your YouTube channel as well. So, and again, this is the start of my Lake Talk and uh, Talk and Tie sessions as we sort of get into the dark part of the year where we're not fishing as much and we just have to bide our uh, enthusiasm in other ways. Uh, so, yeah, uh, get out and enjoy the fall season. If you've got any topics you'd like to see Brian and I uh, ramble on about like we did tonight, please let us know. And... Uh, Brian, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of days, and yeah. maybe on tournament we'll have some. We had back swimmer activity last year, so uh, um, fingers crossed. Whoa, yeah. fingers, I choked myself there. Fingers crossed um, that they will be off there. So, uh, yeah, dust off the vices, everyone. Uh, yeah, although I've been tying pretty well all summer, my usual binge time yeah. before a trip. Your fly box stock, Brian. Take care. We'll see you on uh, Sunday. All right, my friend. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. And this will be recorded uh, for later viewing.